Hey guys, how's it going? Thanks for joining today's video. Um, we've got a really great project today. We are going to be building a donut vending machine smart contract. All right, so this is a great project because we are going to see how to deal with sending and receiving ether to the smart contract. Um, I'm also going to introduce a couple of new data types that we haven't dealt with before, including the address type, UNT256, and the mapping type. So if that sounds good, stick around and let's do this. All right, guys, so before we jump into coding, let's just take a minute to uh, define what it is we're going to be building. So everyone knows what a, a vending machine looks like. You typically put money in, you get a candy bar or something else out of it, right? It's a pretty simple financial transaction. So that's pretty much what we're going to be building as a smart contract today. Um, and so we'll, we'll get a look at how to send and receive funds in Solidity. And we'll get to see some data types which are widely used in pretty much every smart contract that you'll be writing from here on out, which, which is the address type, then the UINT256, which is commonly used to store um, variables that hold some sort of value, some sort of ether value or other numerical value, as well as the mapping, which is sort of like an object in JavaScript used as a pretty much used as a state variable to hold data. Um, in this case, it'll be used to hold balances. So let's just take a quick look at um, some you know, simple architecture for our smart contract. So if we think about what, what are the pieces that we'll need, what are the elements that we'll need to make this transaction happen in code, um, we might first think about what variables we would need. So again, state variables, these are variables that are going to persist between multiple invocations of the smart contract, and these are variables that are gonna be stored on the blockchain. So First of all, we'll need an owner, a variable to hold the address of the owner of the vending machine. Um, and if we think about it, what does an owner of, of a vending machine do? Well, he collects funds um, and he also restocks the vending machine. So that's why we'll need this. Uh, and then we'll need something to hold the balances. The balances not only of the vending machine, but of everyone who's interacted with it. Okay, and then functions. So obviously we'll need a function to execute a purchase. Um, we'll need a function to facilitate the restocking of the vending machine by the owner. And we might want to have a function to get the balance of the vending machine. All right, so the constructor will get called once here when we deploy the smart contract. So what kind of things will we need to set up our smart contract? Well, we'll need to set who the owner is, right? So we'll take the address of the person who's deploying the contract and set that as the owner. We'll set the initial balance of the vending machine. So you know, we may have a starting balance of say 100 donuts, all right? And th that should be all that we need. Um, if we think of anything else as we're going, we'll certainly add that in, but I think this gives us a pretty good start. All right, so now that we've reviewed some basic architecture, it is time to start coding. So what I'm gonna do is open up Chrome and let's go ahead and search for Remix Ethereum. And it should be the first result that comes up. Let's go ahead and select that to open up our Remix in browser editor. All right, and once that loads, you can sort of um, just X out of all of the annoying pop-ups -up, pop here, as well as the home page. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is expand the contracts folder. And I'm gonna select the first sample contract, right click and rename it. And I'm gonna I'm gonna call this one vending machine. All right, now go ahead and select that contract and select all of the code in it and go ahead and delete it. So we're gonna start with a blank slate here. All right, so the first thing I wanna do here is to set my license identifier. So we'll do that in a Solidity comment, two forward slashes and I'll do SPDX license identifier, like so. And I'll choose the MIT license, which basically means open source. All right, and on the next line, I'll set the version of Solidity that we'll be using. So Pragma Solidity caret 0.8.11, which is the latest version 
as of today. All right, next we'll go ahead and define our contract with the contract keyword, and then we'll give it a name, vending machine, and let's give it some curly brackets. Okay, so if you recall to our architectural diagram, we said that we wanted to declare a couple of state variables. Uh, the first one is gonna be the owner, the owner of the vending machine, uh, which is gonna be the address of the person who deployed the contract. So for this variable, we can use a new type called the address type. Now the address type in Solidity holds a 20 byte value, which is the size of an Ethereum address. All right, and we'll declare this one to be public and we'll call it owner. All right, so in the constructor, we will set this to the address of the deployer of the smart contract. All right, so we said we wanted to have one more state variable, uh, and that was gonna be a mapping of the donut balances, since this is a donut vending machine. So we'll talk about a new type in Solidity, which is the mapping type. You can think of this sort of as an object in JavaScript, but only all of the key and values are of the same type. All right, so this is gonna be a mapping basically of Ethereum addresses to the number of donuts that each address owns. So we can start with the mapping keyword and then some curly braces. Inside here, what we wanna do is define the type of the key and value. So we said we wanted to have addresses mapped to the number of items that each address owns. So here we'll introduce another new type, which is uint, unsigned integer. Now this is shorthand for uint256. We just don't have to write the 256 because it's implicit. Uh, but basically what this is, is an unsigned integer, so only positive values from a range of zero to two to the 256th power minus one, uh, which is a huge number. I think it's somewhere around four million something. So it should be good enough for most kind of transactions and most numerical values that your program will need to work with. Okay, we'll set a public access modifier and we'll call this one donut balances. All right, so next we will define our constructor. We said we wanted to do a couple of things in the constructor, set the owner and set the initial donut balances. Oops, I, I see I misspelled that balances. Okay, there we go. So I'll use the constructor keyword to define our constructor. We won't pass in any arguments, so we'll have some empty curly braces. Oh, sorry, empty um, parentheses, and then we'll add some curly braces. Now we want to set the owner here. So the way we can do that is by use of a special global variable, msg and it has a property called sender. All right, so sender is basically the Ethereum address of the originator of the function call or transaction. So in this case, you know, the constructor is gonna be called at the time when the smart contract's deployed, so that will give us the address of the person who deployed the contract. All right, the next thing we said we wanted to do was set an initial donut balance for the vending machine of 100. So the way we can do that is we can use our mapping above that we defined, donut balances, and we can reference the address of the owner. All right, and so address this is a way to give us the address of the current contract. This is something you'll probably use a lot in your Solidity programming. And we can set that to initial value of 100, okay? So this mapping, um, you know, it's important to note that this is going to hold the balance, not only of the vending machine, which is initially 100, but of anybody who interacts with the machine or purchases a donut from the machine. All right, so far so good. So the next thing we have to do is to define some of our functions. All right, so let's take a quick look back at our architectural diagram here, and just to remind ourselves what functions that we have to write. All right, so we said we wanted to have a purchase function to facilitate the purchase of a donut from the vending machine. 
a restock function to add more to the supply, and a get balance. I think what we had in mind here was get balance of the vending machine. Let's start with this one actually, because it's the simplest of the three functions. So I'll go back over to my editor here. And remember to define a function in Solidity, we can start with the function keyword. And so we'll call this one get vending machine balance. You know, um, just a side note, I you know, this may be kind of a long function name, but I tend to err on the side of having my functions and variables named a little bit on the long side rather than have them being um, too vague. Like I could have said get balance, but then, you know, someone might come to this program later and say, what the get balance of what? So I like to be very descriptive, but obviously you can use whatever name you want here. Okay, and so this is going to be a public function because, you know, I think anyone should be able to inquiry as to, you know, what the uh, amount of donuts are in the machine at any given time. I think that's reasonable. Okay, so we'll, we'll set view as the state modification identifier. And again, view, we, you know, we covered some of these concepts in my Smart Contracts 101 video, but just in case you haven't seen that, what view basically means is that this function is not going to modify any data on the smart contract, but it can, or I'm sorry, on the blockchain, but it can read data from the blockchain. So just to give another example, we have pure, which is another choice here, uh, but this means that you're not going to be modifying any data on the blockchain or reading. All right, so in this case, we want view. Now we can set our returns type. And this is going to return a uint to represent the number of donuts. Uh, basically, we'll be you know, reading something from this mapping here. So that's going to be a uint. OK, and so we simply want to return uh, a query into this mapping here. So all we have to really do is copy this from the constructor. OK, so we're saying return return from the donut balances mapping the number of donuts associated with the address of this contract. Okay? Now, of course, we didn't really have to define a function for this. We could sort of just run this code uh, straight away here, but I think it's nice to have this wrapped up into a function and uh, be able to get the total balance at any time easily. All right, so the next function we're gonna tackle is the restock function. And if you recall, this is gonna be the function that will allow the owner of the vending machine to restock it to add more donuts to the machine. All right, so again, we'll start with the function keyword and we'll call this one restock. All right, now this is gonna take an argument representing the number of items being added to the vending machine. So we'll use a uint uh, similarly to what we had in the mapping here. And we'll just call this amount for now. All right, this is gonna be a public function. And because we are actually going to be modifying data on the blockchain by uh, updating this uh, state variable, we're not gonna mark it as view or pure. Um, basically, it's gonna have no restrictions in that regard. So it's not returning anything, so we don't need a return type. So let's just add our curly braces. Okay. Now what we're basically going to be doing, it's very simple. We're just going to be incrementing donut balances for address this. Okay. So I'm going to do donut balances. Address of this. So in other words, address of the current contract. And then I'm just going to increment that by the amount that's passed in here. Okay. All right, so that looks good to me. Um, now there's one thing we said, I think we said this, that we want to restrict the restock function so that it can only be invoked by the owner of the contract. So um, what we can do in Solidity, we can use something called a require statement. And what a require statement does, basically it takes two arguments. The first one is some sort of condition that needs to be fulfilled. And the second argument is an error message that will be displayed or sent back in the case that that requirement, that criteria is not met. So here's what that looks like. 
require. And you know, you may have seen something similar in testing frameworks, uh, but this is a really nice utility to have. So I'm going to say require message.sender equals owner. Okay, so recall that we set the owner to the message.sender during the time of contract creation. Okay, so at this point, it's the person that's deploying the contract. However, this contract, you know, this method could be called by any other outside account. So at that time, the message sender may not necessarily be the same as the owner. All right, so we're checking for that here. And if, if that fails, um, we want to send some sort of error message. So we'll say only the owner can restock this machine. All right, great. So now our restock function is complete, and we will move to our purchase function next. All right, so we're now ready to code our final function, which is the purchase function. Okay, so I'll start with the function keyword. We'll call this purchase, and it's gonna take one argument, which is gonna be the amount of donuts that one wishes to purchase. So this will be of type uint, and again, we'll just call it amount to be kind of general here. This will be a public function. And now we have another special function type to introduce here, which is called payable. And so the payable keyword is used for any function which needs to receive ether. Okay. So if this keyword wasn't here and we were trying to send in any amount of ether, basically the transaction would be reverted if it didn't have this payable keyword. So this is real important to have here. All right, and let's give it some curly braces. Now, what exactly needs to happen inside the purchase function? So basically, if, if I'm buying a donut from the machine, I need to increment my donut balance, and I need to decrement the balance of the vending machine. Okay, so we'll start with the latter. Donut balances, again, we're referencing our our donut balance is mapping, and we're going to say address this, so the address of the contract, decrement by the amount purchased, which is coming in through, through our function argument. Whoops, that should be an equal sign for decrement, okay? All right, so vending machine loses a certain amount of donuts, and we gain a certain amount as the purchaser. So again, we'll reference the donut balances mapping. And this time, we'll update the purchaser's account, which again, we can reference through message.sender. Okay, because now the purchaser is the one who's initiating the function call to purchase donuts. And we'll increment this by the amount. All right, looking good so far. Now, we need a way, we need a couple of checks here. We need to make sure, first of all, that the purchaser is actually sending in some money and sending in enough money. All right, so we, we'll have to set our donut price here. How much do you think we should sell these things for? These are really good donuts, so I, I think we're gonna, we're gonna set a good price here. So we can use our require statement, just as we did in the last function, uh, to verify that the amount coming in is equal to or greater than the price of the donut, okay? So again, we'll use our message global variable, and this time to, to sort of get a reference to the amount of ether coming in, we can do value, message.value, okay? All right, so since we have this here, we don't need to have the, the value being sent in the actual function at the solidity level. Okay, this is gonna be read from the message of the transaction. So we'll make sure this is greater than or equal to um, amount times the donut price. All right, these are really good donuts, so I think we're gonna say two ether. Okay. Now let's provide an error message in case the sender is not sending in that amount or less than that amount. must pay at least two ether per donut. Okay. 
All right, good. So that covers, or that should cover the purchase price. Um, now we want to have one more check to make sure that there are enough donuts in the vending machine to satisfy the, the requester's purchase. So again, we can use another require statement here and we can check the donut balances of address this, okay? So again, we're referencing that same mapping and we're checking the balance of the, uh, the address of the current contract, okay? So we'll make sure that is, um, let's see, how do we do this? Greater than or equal to the amount requested. And then if the vending machine does not have enough, then we'll say not enough donuts in stock to fulfill request. Or purchase request, something like that. All right. Just taking a quick look over to make sure we've got everything here. Oh, do we have some kind of syntax error? Require donut balance. Da, 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 da. No, that, that, I think that looks good. We'll just add our semicolon at the end here. I'm sort of used to leaving it off because I, I stopped using semicolons with JavaScript. Um, oh, you know, it looks like I left it off here too. I'm not sure, I'm not actually sure if that's a hard requirement for Solidity. Uh, let me know if the comments, if anyone knows, but I'll look that up later, but I, I pretty much always use semicolons in Solidity. All right, so I think we're looking good here. Let's save this file. Oh, what do we have here? Ah, okay. We need to set our compiler version. Uh, we ran into the same error in my Solidity Contracts 101 video. And basically you just come over here and you can set the compiler version of Remix to match what you have here. And then once you do control save or save it, that should go away. And, whoa, looks like we have some other errors to take care of. Oh, looks like I've got some spelling errors. Donut balances. What did I do wrong here? Did you mean donut balances? Ah, okay, I spelled it wrong on line six. <laughs> Um, hopefully nobody copied that, or you guys probably saw it way before I did. You know, this is me trying to talk and type at the same time, which I'm not that great at. But getting better. Balances, there we go. Control save. Okay, good, so most of those errors went away. I guess they were related to that. Um, I've still got one here, so let's see what's going on on line 19. Your unary operator cannot be applied to type uint256. What am I doing wrong here? Ah, another typo. This should be equals. So sorry about that if you guys um, copied that verbatim. All right, I think we're in good shape now. Great. So I'll, I will uh, post this code actually on GitHub just to make sure if anyone copied my stupid errors, uh, just to make sure you've got the final copy if you need it. Okay, we are done coding, so the next thing we're going to do is compile and deploy our code and uh, test out our contract here. So, uh, make sure you're on this tab here, the, the second one, the Solidity Compiler. Go ahead and click on this button to compile our code. Okay. Now go down one tab further where you see this uh, little Ethereum logo, Deploy and Run Transactions. And we can go ahead and deploy our code. Our constructor isn't taking any arguments, so we don't need to set anything. Just go ahead and click on deploy. All right, you should see a little success message down here once that's finished. And um, down, if you scroll down a little bit under deployed contracts, you should see our vending machine contract. Oh, back up a step. So, sorry, I um, forgot to mention, just make sure that this is on JavaScript VM. This should be the default, but this just ensures that we're deploying our contract to the virtual JavaScript blockchain. So that way no costs are incurred or anything like that. All right, and the de deployment happens really quickly, pretty much instantly. Oops, didn't mean to do that. 
Okay. Oh, what did I do? I need to redeploy. I, I fat figured something and I'm not sure what I did here. Oh. I think as I was explaining this, I accidentally... See, I'm working without a, mass, uh, a mouse here on this laptop and, you know, I'm, I'm using one of these trackpads and it's... It's not good. I just... Uh, it's real easy to sort of hit the wrong button on it. I don't have enough USBs to support a mouse and my microphone at the same time right now, so I've got to fix that problem. All right, anyway, sorry for that diversion. Once you deploy, um, go ahead and expand your vending machine smart contract, and you can see you know, a representation of all of the uh, state variables and functions that we defined. So we can go ahead and start testing these out. Um, let's do get vending machine balance. So if you remember, we passed in 100. Great, this gives us 100. So we're stocked up with 100 donuts. Um, now, if you saw the Smart Contracts 101 video, so I explained that whenever we define any state variables, we automatically, uh, for free, behind the scenes, get a getter function for each one. So that's what this is. This is our getter function for owner. So if we click on that, we should see our address. Very good. And that should correspond with the address that you have set here under account. This is our default address. So basically when you use Remix and you deploy a smart contract to the virtual JavaScript blockchain, it gives you a bunch of accounts to work with, you know, for testing purposes. Okay, let's see what else do we have here. Um, let's, uh, let's try to go ahead and purchase some donuts. All right, so I'm gonna purchase two donuts. Okay, that should cost me four ether. So let's go ahead and if you scroll up just a little bit, we can actually enter in the amount of ether that we wanna send with the transaction. And that goes in the value field right here. So if you see here, it's, it's defaulted to weigh. We could go to ether and easily just add four, um, or we could work with weigh and Way is a subset of Ether or a division of Ether, and so sometimes the math is a little bit difficult. So I just like to use a little uh, calculator, way to Ethereum. Um, let's see, way to Ethereum converter. I think this is what I'm looking for. So let's say I want to represent four ether. Okay, that's gonna be this many way. So I'm just gonna copy and paste this in into our value field here. I think that worked, okay. I'll scroll back down a bit. Click on purchase. Oh, and it looks like it failed for some reason. Let's see what's happening here. So we got our error message, you must pay at least two ether per donut. Hmm, so for some reason, it did not get the four ether that I attempted to send in. You know, I wonder if something happened when I copy pasted. Let's go back up. I don't know if that just reset or if I didn't copy and paste this correctly. Let me try again. I think I had that leading zero, maybe that's the problem. So just make sure you do a little backspace there. And I'll just try to click in this field and verify. There we go. Let's try it again. I think that was the problem, hopefully. All right, so I'm purchasing two, so I need two ether. Let's try it again. Another message, you know what? I wonder if, um, I'm probably not accounting for gas fees. Each transaction in Ethereum uses a certain amount of gas. So let me just try to buy one and see if that works. <laughs> All right, so again, I'm pasting in what should represent four either. Oops. All right, let's try this again. This time I'm gonna just try to purchase one. I should definitely have enough for one. 
including gas fees. So let's see if this works for us. Yay, okay. <laughs> so a couple of lessons in there. Um, you know, I, I attempted to purchase four ether worth of donuts with exactly four ether. I failed to account for gas fees. So that I think that's what's going on there. So I purchased one. Now, if everything worked correctly, the balance of our vending machine should have gone down to 99. So let's check that. Looking good. Okay. Now um, we can use the donut balances mapping to actually check our account balance and make sure that we we got the donut that we purchased. So if you go up to the account field here and click on the copy icon, that should copy the address for us. Now I'm going to scroll back down and I'm going to paste that into donut balances. Oops. Okay. And there we go. I've got one donut. All right. Looking good so far. So, so we basically tested our um, our require statement that you must have enough money to pay for the donuts. <laughs> Let's try to restock our uh, vending machine next. All right, so I'm the owner and my current account is set up here. So I should be able to get past the owner check and I should be able to just enter an amount of donuts. So I'll tell you what, let's just add that one that we just lost and try that first and see if our account doesn't go back up to 100. So we'll do restock. Good, we got a success message there. Now let's get our vending machine balance. And you can kind of see what I meant when I said it's nice to have a function just to get the vending machine balance so I don't have to um, go back here and change the address every time. All right, now let's, chest, let's check something else. Let's try to update the balance um, while we're not set as the owner. And so we should get this message, only the owner can restock this machine. So what I'm gonna do is go back up to the top and I'm gonna select one of our other accounts as the active account. So I'll just go ahead and select the second one and we'll try to restock again. And uh, if our code is working correctly, this should not work. So let's try to add five, restock. And we got an error message, good. Only the owner can restock this machine. Good, so our error handling seems to be working great for that function. We seem to be in good shape. Um, all of our functions seem to be working as expected. And this is just really a great environment to test out contracts, to play around with the functions. And um, it just, Remix makes it super easy to be able to send ether and, and test out financial transactions and things like that. So. Yeah, so I think that's all that I wanted to accomplish this video. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, hope you learned something. You know, a lot of the concepts that we covered in this video are things that you'll be using very frequently in Solidity programming. I mean, things like addresses, mapping, uh, the message object. These are all really, you know, common and important concepts to know. So um, simple contract, but hopefully you got a good amount of knowledge out of it. All right, guys, so I'll be making some videos. I think we'll continue along this track and try to tackle some even more complex contracts going forward in the future. Um, I know I want to do a, a token contract and probably uh, some NFT contracts as well. So look forward to those in the future. Um, please feel free to like and subscribe if you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you in the next one. All right, guys, take care. Bye.